pray as we continue. God, uh, thank you. Thank you for the gifts that you pour through people in different ways. Gifts that we often cannot predict. Gifts that are unexpected. Gifts that you choose to use. And this morning we are grateful for these words and this story. And I pray that you would pour through me your gift of preaching and imagination. For it is in your name that I pray. Amen. You know, it doesn't take an expert on discipleship to consider that Simon Peter's life was a story of unplanned adventure. Jesus comes to, to Simon and his family and they're fishing and then Jesus says, guess what? Your entire life is now going to be fishing for men. And then Peter takes off on this glorious adventure of fishing for men, following a, a Jewish rabbi that was unplanned because Peter was untrained. And yet Jesus said, no, come with me on this great adventure. If you recall, Peter is found at his mother-in-law's house, and she's not just sick, she's dying. And so the rabbi places his hands on an unclean sick person, and Peter's mother-in-law is miraculously healed. And the adventure is that Peter is going to receive the gift of healing. And then, of course, we have this great declaration of Peter announcing that, Jesus, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the one that we have been waiting for. And Jesus turns and looks at Simon Peter and says, yes, upon that confession, this rock, I'm going to build my church. And it wasn't too long after that that the declaration turned into denial. And, and Peter, as I'm sure you can guess, felt this deep sense of shame and yet the unplanned adventure didn't end with the denial. It continued with yet even more declaration because, well, God still had lots of work to do. It doesn't take a discipleship expert to consider that Peter, his life is a story of unplanned adventure. And the adventure is where we are this morning in Acts chapter 10 verse 11. Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. When, when Peter is continuing this adventurous journey, but Jesus is no longer with them. Uh, their leader is not to be seen with human eyes. And the leader is not Peter. The leader is, in fact, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and fills Peter in an extraordinary way. And Peter preaches to thousands of people and thousands of people are converted and the Holy Spirit leads Peter to heal a, a crippled beggar outside the gates of the temple. And then Peter and John are thrown in prison. And the church comes together and prays. And they pray. And the doors of the room where they're praying are shaking. And the Holy Spirit continues to lead and to prod. And then we come to this moment. This moment that is going to capitalize on God's mission that was begun not with Jesus but with Abraham. When God comes to Abraham and says, through you I'm going to bless all nations. And so Peter finds himself hungry, which I'm sure many of you are. And he goes up to a roof and he falls asleep and then God comes in and talks to Peter and says the strangest thing. Peter, you see all these unclean animals that you've been told your entire life, that your generations have been told their entire life not to eat? I want you to rise up, kill those animals, and eat. Now, parenthetically, what you ought to understand is that this is more than a story of Peter having permission to eat bacon. This is about who Peter is going to eat bacon with. 
This is the social restructure of the kingdom of God where it's not just Jews, now it's Gentiles. And it's not just a sprinkling of folks that Jesus has interacted with or that Peter has begun to interact with, but it's the full-blown inclusion of the most unexpected guests to the table. And, And if you'll notice, Peter is greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision. Now, is Peter puzzled? Absolutely. But I'd like to suggest that Peter is not at all surprised. Because Peter knows, as a good Jewish boy, that this is how God works. God reveals the mission in ways you don't expect, often through the gift of imagination. Now, when I say imagination, let's not confuse that with imaginary. Um, imaginary is what I experienced, uh, you know, a few days ago when I went to see what's that movie that's out, Avenger? Yeah. I'm kidding. Endgame. Raise your hand if you've seen it. Yeah, the rest of you are just losers. <laughs> so. It's, it's set to make the most money of any movie ever put out. And wouldn't you know it, if you go back and you trace the top-selling movies of all time, all the top ten are imaginary realities. They're invitations into a world where you can get lost, but as soon as the movie's over and the popcorn is done, you walk out and you begin to live life knowing intellectually that that life is not really possible. There's not going to be a Darth Vader or a lightsaber or there's not going to be a hammer that you can wield or, or a shield that can fend off Nazis. And so you go about life longing to go back to the imaginary world. But the gift of imagination, this is where I think God moves in and says, I want you to imagine what it would look like if I were truly king. Imagination is when God moves in and says, you think you have things figured out, but stand by because I'm about to do something wondrous, extraordinary, and mysterious, and it's going to rock your world. Imagination is when God comes to Abraham in Genesis 15 and he cuts meat in half and there's a smoking fire pot and Abraham is left wondering, what's this all about? And God says, I'm here to make covenant with you, Abraham. I am here to enter into relationship with you, never to leave you, never forsake you. Imagination is when God comes to Jacob. Jacob! What a dirty rat. I mean, the guy lies to his parents. He tricks his dad, who happens to be old and blind. And then he flees for his life. And as he's running from his li- for his life, from the blessing that he stole from his brother by lying, God comes to Jacob and descends on a ladder, on a stairway, and says, Jacob, I'm going to change your name to Israel. And it's going to be through you and through your sons that my people are going to find me again. Imagination. Imagination is what comes to Gideon when he feels like he's the smallest in the army. And if you remember there in Judges chapter 6, God shows up to Gideon and Gideon says, Okay, big fancy pants God, if you're as great as you are, then why is all this stuff happening to us? And God says, well, Gideon, I'm glad you asked because you are going to lead Israel against the Midianites. Gideon says, no, (laughs) let me get a fleece. (laughs) And he goes and he tests the imagination and God still continues to pursue. And this is how God works. God lives through not just what could be, but what should be. Do you remember the prophets when When God's people were in exile and the prophets came and said, there will be a day when the lion shall lie with the lamb, 
There will be a day when a king will come, and he's not going to look like who you expect, but he's coming. Trust me. You see, that's the gift of imagination. And God's imagination moves one step forward in the work of Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus comes and even uses imaginative language by telling parables. Because guess what? The kingdom of God is too good to describe in simple black and white terms. No, the kingdom of God is like, well, it's like a dad that has two sons. And one of his boys comes and says, give me what I deserve. And the father gives it to him. And he goes off and he squanders it. You may know this story as the prodigal son, but I've got news for you. It's the story of a prodigal, wasteful God who meets that boy on his way back, wraps his arms around him and throws a party. Did he deserve it? Absolutely not. But this is what the imagination of God does he leads us to imagine what it would look like if God really would give us what we didn't deserve. Then it comes time for Jesus to depart. And he looks squarely at Simon Peter and he says, Peter, I'm not going to leave you alone. I've just called you to feed my sheep, to lead my church, but I'm going to give you a part of myself. A part of Father and of son, and now the spirit that's going to live inside of you. And I imagine right there at the beginning of Acts 1, Peter's like, what is this about? And Peter just goes with it. Tongues of fire, shaking doorposts, healing, imprisonment. And now Peter's on a roof. What, what are we to make of this story? Is imagination really for us? Uh, several of you have come up to me in the past and asked, Pat, why do you pray for the gift of imagination? I pray for the gift of imagination because I still believe God has an imagination for who we ought to be as disciples. And that, and that God gives us a vision for who we ought to be because of the mission of God that is still ongoing through us. You realize we pray about this every single Sunday as we close service. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is imagination at work. Are we just going to pray that or are we going to believe it and declare it? My friends, what if our posture of discipleship was so rooted in imagination that we were able to relinquish our control of who God ought to be. C.S. Lewis says this, what matters, what heaven desires and hell fears is precisely that further step out of our own control. That further step. This is what the Spirit of God does. Moves us to take that further step. I'd even suggest that this is what the waters of baptism do. It invites us into a further step with God on mission. This is what the table does at communion. It invites us into a further step that's beyond our control because we are not the host of the table. Jesus is. It invites us with a further step as we gather around the word, the words of God for the people of God, not just words on the page, but words that are meant to be embodied by the church for the sake of the world, for the sake of God's mission. Imagination matters. And as disciples who are committed to loving, growing, and sending, we have to get back to seeing ourselves in this story. We have to see ourselves as Peter, Dreaming on roofs, being open to what God has in store for us. The story of Simon Peter can be our story too. But all week long, there's been a story of another Peter that's come to mind. Uh, th this Peter was actually created in 1953. It was reimagined in 2003. But in 1991, there was a particular rendering of this Peter. 
Peter Pan. And if you've never seen the movie Hook, go out and rent it tonight. It's worth it just to watch Dustin Hoffman as Captain Hook. But the way the story is told really sunk in with me. It opens not with Peter Pan prancing around in this silly green outfit with pixie dust, but rather Hook opens with Peter Pan the adult on his cell phone watching his children play baseball. And you are shown very quickly that Peter has grown out of his imagination. He's too old. He's too consumed. Success has driven him. Busyness has driven him. And his relationships have suffered. And so Captain Hook comes and takes Peter's children away. And Peter must return to Neverland. But Peter returns to Neverland as a non-believing adult. Imagination is silly. Play is for kids. His wonder has been lost. And as you can imagine, in true Disney-esque fashion, the movie goes on. Uh, Peter rediscovers this gift of imagination and play. And the lost boys gather. And there's this epic battle on a ship with Captain Hook. And all is made well with Peter and his children. But what I keep wondering is, is which Peter do we want to be like here at the Highland Oaks Church? Because Simon Peter is an adult who is taking discipleship seriously, and yet Simon Peter is open to the gift of imagination. Peter Pan, the adult, is not. He's so consumed with the world around him that he's forgotten completely about the world within him. And it's imaginary, it's fun. Julia Roberts plays Tinkerbell. But what we learn is that there is something deep within Peter Pan that has been created to be different. And you see, that's what Simon Peter has. Simon Peter has someone different living in him that enables him to see God. The Holy Spirit is at work in Simon Peter. And the crazy thing about this story is that the Holy Spirit's at work in Cornelius, a centurion, a Gentile, the leader of a Roman army. And if you're a Jew hearing this story in the first century, you're not just scratching your head. You're standing away from this text and you're thinking, what strange fire is coming out of these words? You mean to tell me that the very people who are occupying my home state are the ones I'm supposed to sit at the table with? Loving, growing, and sending cannot be so well studied and so well orchestrated that we have it all figured out because that's not how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works as Peter makes himself available to listen. You know, our society says, don't sit there, do something. The Holy Spirit says, don't do something, sit there. This is what Peter is doing. God speaks when Peter is just sitting there. If you're struggling with discipleship and wondering where the Holy Spirit is, perhaps it's not God who has left you, but it's you that's left God. Perhaps it's because your life is in such perpetual motion that you are not still enough to hear the whisper of God. Or did you notice in the text that Peter was puzzled? Which leads me to believe that part of the Holy Spirit's work is giving us questions instead of answers. Why in the world do we assume that faith is something to be sorted out? Every single detail. My goodness, if Peter could have predicted the way the church was going to move in Acts, there would be no church in Acts. Acts. 
But Peter wasn't predicting it. The Holy Spirit was leading it. And it was up to Peter to come up with questions. And in the way he was puzzled, Peter listened to the Spirit. And if you think Peter was comfortable, I challenge you to think about what it must have been like to be Peter. If you think this was easy, I challenge you to think about what it must have been like to be Peter. Because as good as knowing about the Holy Spirit is, it's quite another thing to live into the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit's role is moving Peter and you from a place of comfort to a place of discomfort. And the Holy Spirit does that around the table. My friends, are you willing to join Simon Peter? Or are you still locked into the world of Peter Pan? Because this is not imaginary. This is God's imagination unfolding through you the church who follows Christ, the church who creates space for the Spirit of God to work. So when we sing, let your Spirit come, we need to be ready to let the Spirit come. May God give us the gift of imagination for these unplanned adventures that are yet to be seen. Let those who have ears to hear, hear the word of God. Mm -hmm.